hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Matt Kokum with DSM Firminish, uh, and today we'll be talking about omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, DSM Firminish has developed a sustainably sourced form of omega-3s to protect patients and our planet. And today, my colleague Charles Perez will talk about what inspired us and what we've done. Charles is the Director of Gr Global Product Management at DSM Firminish and he's been instrumental in the development and launch of new omega-3 oil products. But first and foremost, we want to talk about how omega-3 fatty acids can bring meaningful benefits to patients in peri perioperative care. Today, our guide to the clinical applications of omega-3s will be Dr. Martin Rosenthal. Dr. Martin Rosenthal is an associate professor of surgery at the University of Florida Division of Acute Care Surgery the Director of the Abdominal Wall Reconstruction and Intestinal Rehabilitation Service, and the Chair of the University of Florida Nutrition Committee. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Rosenthal to the podium. Take it away, Dr. Rosenthal. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I want to take a moment and say thanks to DSM for having me. Um, you know, this is something that I do feel very passionate about with uh, omega-3 fatty acids. And uh, it's also something that I find uh, a little bit of a learning experience because oftentimes when I think of omega-3 fatty acids, I do think about predominantly fish oil. But uh, in recent uh, events, I went back and started reading more about the uh, alga forms of omega-3 fatty acids and different derivations of omega-3 fatty acids. And I think it's kind of important at this point to start thinking about the omega-3 fatty acid uh, EPA, DHA derivatives to be more of just the family of omega-3s. And, and instead of just simplifying it and calling it fish oil, we should just be calling it the omega-3 fatty acids. And so my disclosures um, and our learning objectives, understand the role of the omega-3 fatty acids in clinical practice, visit an evol evolving body of literature, and then discuss both pre and post-operative roles uh, for our fatty acids and then kind of the bioactive byproduct of omega-3 fatty acids. We're going to touch on some of the uh, specialized pro-resolving mediators that Charles Zerhan uh, has made very popular. So omega-3 fatty acids, you know, EPA DHA from fish oil uh, minimizes infl uh, inflammatory response by decreasing production of the inflammatory mediators. It helps kind of get into lipid rafts. It helps with uh, immunomodulation helps with cell signaling, and so uh, it increases the immune response by en enhancing lymphocyte function. But unfortunately, specifically in the United States, largely predicated from the fact that uh, our diets are not uh, rich with uh, fish, um, 655 adult U.S. residents kind of were screened, and almost 90% were uh, omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid deficient. I think that's incredibly low. Um, I can vouch for my son and say that he doesn't like fish, but I make him eat it. You know, being six years old, he, he can't live off of chicken nuggets and uh, French fries the rest of his life. So, you know, any little bit that we can actually provide for our friends, families, uh, give them the information I think is going to be beneficial. So then looking more toward the alga forms. Uh, I went back in PubMed, I tried to find some relevant articles, and it was just a slew all over the place. And it seems to, you know, right around about 20 to 25 years ago, uh, there's been an exponential growth in the body of literature following uh, the alga forms of omega-3 fatty acids. And here's one. These aren't, you know, particularly relevant. It's just more fun because we're seeing different sources of EPA, DHA coming on how that um, there's systemic literature reviews now. Uh, it is a great vegetarian base um, uh, way to get omega-3 fatty acids. But you know, more prevalent is now we're starting to see studies and we're starting to see randomized control trials. We're starting to see studies that are gonna be helping to guide clinical practice. You know, If you do a review or you have an idea you hypothesize it, you do a, a pilot study, then, you know, there's a case cohort, there's some sort of retrospective review, but it isn't until you get to the multi-center randomized control trials that we should really be adapting in, um, into clinical practice. 
And so even, even different species are now being investigated to see what kind of uh, help and benefit they may give to us. So what does it actually mean for the uh, perioperative patients? This comes out of the surgical body. Uh, being a surgeon, uh, you know, this is my bread and butter. It kind of gets into prehabilitation, which I would dare say most surgeons probably don't do the best job of. But strong for surgery is this concept of prehabilitation, looking at a perioperative checklist of nutrition, glycemic control. Usually you want your A1C to be less than seven. Medication management, you know, if your patient's on uh, any type of blood thinner, when to stop it, when to hold it, how big of a burden is it going to be to be on antiplatelet therapy, certainly smoking cessation, uh, safe and effective pain management strategies in the realm of the opiate pandemic, we're looking for multimodality pain uh, controls, delirium prediction that usually falls into patients older than 65 uh, that have to spend time in the ICU, and then the prehabilitation and patient directives. And now there's actually, if you go to trials.gov, uh, there's a trial going on, and this was uh, actually, April, I want to say it was April of 21, 2022, um, they're actually doing strong for surgery in uh, cancer surgery at this point. So the idea of trying to prehabilitate some of our cancer patients is very important. But as we know, you know, it's very difficult to sometimes prehabilitate somebody's new malnutrition if they're already going into cancer cachexia. But I'm going to focus a little bit more on the uh, nutrition and the idea of these ERAS or enhanced recovery after surgery. Uh, using a meta-analysis published back in 2012, uh, the combination of immune modulating nutrients uh, in patients undergoing ma uh, major abdominal gastrointestinal surgery, you could see that out of 2,500 patients in 26 randomized control trials, uh, there was a five to say, uh, you had to be taking the immunonutrition for five to seven days to show a benefit. 26 out of 26 of the randomized control trials showed that there was an infectious complication decrease of about 36%. There was, it was impactful in non-infectious complications and the uh, decrease in length of stay. I would say uh, that is probably the signal. So decrease in infection, decrease in length of stay for immunonutrition. That's actually bored out in uh, more recent meta-analyses and uh, ultimately as with most anything in our nutrition literature, there was no impact in mortality. It's very hard to randomize people to no nutrition and some nutrition. I'm pretty sure your local IRBs wouldn't go for that. Again, looking at immunonutrition, uh, there's no difference in mortality, but in this JPEN article, uh, they found that there was a decrease in infection and now we're seeing an impact on uh, anastomotic dehiscence or anastomotic leak. Being a self-proclaimed fistula surgeon, that's very impactful. Uh, you know, you don't want to do a bowel operation and then have the dreaded leak. 74 studies, about 7,500 patients, and this other one published uh, by Mazaki in uh, Annals of Surgery. Overall complications were decreased, infectious complication, uh, intra-abdominal abscess formation, and nasomotic leak, sepsis. And actually, this one did find a mortality benefit, which uh, is pretty rare. So 35 articles looking predominantly at uh, arginine and fish oil, which is probably the two components in uh, immunonutrition that is, uh, has the strongest signal, I would say. Uh, significant reduction in overall infection, again, reduction in hospital length of stay. Subgroup analysis, treatment effect regardless of the type of surgery. Uh, no decrease in mortality and greatest effect when given pre and post-op. This is a uh, study that we were involved with uh, back in 2020. And so uh, since 2012, there was about 49 studies, uh, 3,600. We actually found a couple more. And what we see is uh, when we're looking at predominantly parenteral uh, omega-3 fatty acids, the signal still remains that there was a 40% lower uh, incidence of infection 56% reduction in sepsis. There was a decrease of length of stay by about two days. Though there was no statistical significance, uh, there was a trend uh, in reduction in mortality using omega-3 fatty acids prior to uh, foregut and gastrointestinal uh, operations. 
So now we talked a little bit about the immunomodulatory form of omega-3 fatty acids and how it may impact the, uh, the healing patient. But what about patients post-op? So we looked at, at the University of Florida in a uh, P50 grant, uh, what it might actually mean to have some kind of paradigm that will decrease inflammation. Because one of the things that one of my mentors, a guy named Fred Moore, uh, popularized is this idea of persistent inflammation, immunosuppression, catabolic syndrome. It's called PICS, which is not to be confused with the other PICS, uh, which is post-intensive care syndrome or post-ICU uh, syndrome. Uh, so we're looking more at like a biomechanical reason why patients still remain inflamed. Uh, they chew up their lean muscle mass, they're immunosuppressed, and they have this poor dismal kind of outcome. And one of the things that we were looking at was maybe immunonutrition, omega-3 fatty acids, because it largely is impactful at decreasing the inflammatory burden. Uh, that signal is true across most anything. When you look at omega-3 literature and you look at biomarkers, they all look at what? CRP, IL-6, IL-10, IL-1, TNF-alpha. Um, and so the biomarkers are uh, reduced in folks that have omega-3 fatty acids circulating both uh, pre-op and post-op. And so when we looked at our patient population, the chronic critically ill uh, PICS paradigm, we found 56 patients that were chronic critically ill. Uh, and I compared them to 112 patients, which we called RAP, which is the rapid recovery. They actually got out of the ICU uh, prior to the 14 day mark of uh, being kind of pushing more into a chronic illness at that point. We, uh, we did uh, some matching with the Charleston Comorbidity Index, sex, age, Apache 2 score. So basically we took everybody and we said, you know, we're gonna try and make you as sick as everybody else and we matched them. Uh, we did reasonably well. So when you look at the literature at major academic institutions, how well we feed our patients, it's kind of all over the map and it's scary low. Like uh, when you look at goal calories delivered to our patients, it's anywhere between 40 and 60%. And if you can get higher than that, you're winning. And it has something to do probably with yeah, surgeons being knuckleheads and stopping stuff for studies and going back for surgery and anesthesia saying that, you know, we're not going to put a patient to sleep unless you pause it, the, you know, at midnight the night before and, you know, having to get IR do this and CT do that and MRI do that and pain do this. So, you know, there's reasons to stop and hold nutrition, although uh, a lot of them are uh, only anecdotal at best. There's no evidence that you have better outcomes doing some of that. And it gets frustrating, but we did, we did reasonably well, you know, uh, the patients received 75% of their goal calories for the period of time that we were studying them for a month. But if I excluded, uh, the first week, we actually achieved 88%. And so to me, that means I'm dealing with a surgical critical care and trauma ICU. So that means the first week was source control or polytrauma. And so maybe my patient was in GI discontinuity. Uh, they were so sick and on pressors that we felt uncomfortable feeding them. Uh, and then, you know, by the end of that week, their uh, GI continuity is restored. They're off pressors. The antibiotics are working. I popped the intra-abdominal pimple and they're getting better. So I think from that standpoint, they're doing okay. But look at this. So non-home discharge in our patient population 81% of uh, the rapid recovery uh, had a, what we would say a reasonable disposition, and that was either to rehab or home. Only 29 or a third of the CCI patients got to do that. I think that's pretty incredible. So if you're stuck in the ICU for 14 days with, I'm not going to say multi-organ failure, but multi-organ dysfunction, uh, that was predictive of a poor discharge. That means you're going to an LTAC. That means you're going to rehab. That means you might be going to the morgue. And the 12 month survival rate, again, was much lower for the uh, CCI folks than it was compared to uh, for our uh, rapid recovery. So looking at biomarkers, again, getting back to inflammation, you could see that rapid recovery had much lower uh, levels of inflammation, IL-6, IL-8, than the chronic critically ill 
there was lower immunosuppression based off of the absolute, uh, absolute lymphocyte count and uh, program death ligand one or SPDL one, which is kind of popular now as a form of immunosuppression. Uh, and then less catabolism or at least less stress metabolism, right? So uh, glucagon like peptide was lower and then the urinary three methylhistidine, and I've shown these slides before, but uh, the three methylhistidine is a marker of protein uh, catabolism that is excreted in the urine. And so I've actually received scrutiny in uh, some talks past where somebody said, well, what if they had an AKI? So I actually went back, I don't have that slide today, but I went back and um, did a ratio of the urinary 3-methylhistidine to creatinine ratio to make sure that uh, I wasn't missing a signal and it actually mimics this. And so the CCI cohort had, though it wasn't statistically significant, they had more muscle breakdown than the rapid recovery, which essentially equates to, you know, what we call ICU acquired weakness, uh, ICU uh, catabolism syndrome, uh, respiratory or ICU associated respiratory dysfunction. These are the reasons is because they're breaking down their lean muscle mass. And so functional outcome by no surprise, uh, Zubrod, uh, disability score. Again, you want a golf score if you're talking about Zubrod and, uh, rapid recovery was much lower. Ladies and gentlemen, three and a half, your four is you're fully dependent on somebody else. Five means you're almost dead. Three and a half means you're somewhere between, uh, completely debilitated and bed bound it means you're needing somebody to help you daily. That's going to the bathroom. That's cleaning yourself short physical, uh, performance battery. Uh, the rapid recovery were able to do, you know, the five minute walk test. They were able to do the stand up, sit down, uh, and they were able to, uh, perform better than the, um, unfortunately the, the CCI group or the, uh, PICS group and then quality of life. If I'm out of any ICU uh, before 14 days, I'll be very thankful. So, I mean, quality of life trends with that. I hope to never find an ICU. I'll work in one. I don't like hospitals, but I'll, I'll stay there and help. Um, so, you know, quality of life goes up when uh, we're getting people restored to their functional baseline at home. So why am I bringing any of that up? I do think that when you think about the PICS paradigm, that that inflammation is kind of playing a factor into two of those pillars. The more inflamed you are, the more catabolic you are going to be by nature. Inflammation drives energy, uh, an energy sink. And so the more ATP you're burning because you're trying to produce that surge response, the more catabolic by nature you're going to end up being. And so if there's something that is going to be impactful for our PICS patients, I'm not going to say it's a silver bullet, but I do think that omega-3 fatty acids do play a role into decreasing that inflammatory response. So I, I like to practice what I preach. I myself will take uh, my omega-3 fatty acids uh, on a daily basis because as a trauma surgeon, if I ever am in a car accident, I want my molecular and uh, biomolecular constructs to already be in my body. I'm pre oping myself, right? Stanley Dudrick uh, was uh, a huge proponent of developing these, uh, paradigms and nutrition, TPN and all that stuff. But the, the guy, um, that was insurmountably impactful was one of the cardiothoracic surgeons out of Texas. He said, you know, the world is your pre-op. So I'm telling myself I'm my own pre-op. So I'm going to start taking fish oil in case I ever get injured or sick. I like to think that, you know, when I get a cold or I get COVID or again, or something like that, then the, uh, the uh, length of illness will be reduced as well. But I actually, I guess as my own uh, case uh, control, I haven't seen that happen just yet. So the future of research, you know, specialized pro resolving mediators. This is Charles Surham. Uh, he was up at uh, Mass General. Uh, the story kind of goes that he uh, came down with appendicitis. And so uh, he, there's a billion dollar industry looking at things that might turn off uh, SIRS. And some of us that are, are old enough, we think about, you know, Zygris, we think about some of these medications that were all pulled from the market because they actually caused problems instead of helped problems. But as is everything in nature, there's a yin and a yang. So he said, if there's something that promotes SIRS and something that promotes sepsis, there's got to be some sort of endogenous pathway that promotes healing or resolution of inflammation. And so he came up with these ideas 
he found that there were actually three different species, all derived from either EPA or DHA, and they were called the maricins, the neuroprotectins are now the, the protectins, and uh, the resolvins. And so these little um, bioactive components of omega-3 fatty acids or just uh, very low concentrations, nano and picomolar, actually show a benefit. And so... Uh, I don't want to go too far into this, uh, but I do think that this is going to be uh, the future of some of our nutritional, uh, nutraceutical endeavors uh, for some of our highly inflamed patients. You know, we actually thought about it and um, ultimately, could they uh, be commercialized here? There are commercialized precursors for these that you can even find on Amazon, whether or not they're beneficial uh, is yet to be uh, understood. And so you can actually see all the ongoing research that's uh, happening with these SPMs. Most of these models currently are in uh, animal models, uh, but one of Sirhan's disciples, uh, Dali, is in uh, the UK. He's actually now starting to do some uh, human trials. The first one he actually looked at was uh, in critical, critically ill patients. So with that, our summary, there is a robust level of it evidence regarding nutritional optimization of our surgical patients that, you know, that's, we have to be doing that in every institution. It's very difficult and I get it, it's time consuming, uh, but we need to be doing that. There is uh, ongoing support for precision immune nutrition to augment inflammation, immunosuppression and catabolism. Omega-3 fatty acids uh, hold great potential and these SPMs I do think may be the uh, future. And then uh, uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague Charles and I appreciate your attention. Thank you so much. Testing. Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, to be here to talk about a subject that's near and dear to my heart. It's also a pleasure to be on the same stage as Martin to hear his talk. I had a chance to have dinner last night, and we both share a tremendous passion for uh, the benefits of the EPA and DHA and how it can help uh, help human nutrition and, and and human health. So, so thank you, Martin, for uh, for all of that. Um, before we get in. Probably most folks in the room don't know who DSM for Minish is, and that's uh, that's fine. So I'll spend just a quick second explaining that so you can understand, hey, why should I listen to these folks and uh, what do they have good to say? So DSM for Minish, it's actually a company that only created a year ago, a merger between DSM. We were and are the largest manufacturer of omega-3s in the world and a major player in, uh, in global vitamin production, going back to the legacy of Roche vitamins. Furminish was one of the biggest flavors and fragrances houses in the world. Both companies, importantly, for the purposes of this discussion, um, tremendous background and belief that innovation and science and R&D are critical, not just to the profitability of the company, but for future innovation in human health. Few of our key R&D related metrics, I'll focus only on the one in the lower right hand corner, annually we spend over $700 million in R&D related expenditures, again, R&D, innovation, science, critically important to us as an organization. With that said, I move on to, uh, to a general statement. We need omega-3s beyond even the comments made by Martin in the perioperative care space. We need omega-3s both as consumers, we need omega-3s, but we, and I say we, I mean more specifically, you need omega-3s as a tool in your toolbox to help improve patient outcomes. How can I be so confident in this? Actually, all goes back to two Danish scientists in the early 1970s. You see a picture of them in the lower left-hand corner, doctors uh, Bang on the left and Dyerberg on the right. They made an observation. They said, why is it? Why is it that Inuit from northern Canada, Greenland, northern Scandinavia consume a tremendous amount of animal fat, but they don't, they don't get cardiovascular disease? Why is that? So they examined that and ultimately came to the conclusion that it comes from the EPA and DHA in the fish that they consume. And from that body of research, now 50 years later, you have an entire industry 
um, around omega-3s and incredibly well-studied molecules, 40,000 scientific papers, 4,000 human clinical trials. And you see that the body of research extends well beyond cardiovascular space. And there are a couple of very good drugs in the market today for treating cardiovascular disease. Vasipa, which is basically pure EPA, Lavaza, which is a mixture of EPA and DHA. But beyond that, you know, Martin talked about inflammation and, uh, and immunity eye health, cognitive health, DHA is the dominant fatty acid in the brain, all the way to infant nutrition. You may not know who DSM Furmanish is, but I, uh, I guarantee that you or somebody close to you has consumed our products. Uh, if you have small children or relatives who have children, the DHA we manufacture goes into the vast majority of infant formula sold in the United States today. So we have a very long legacy uh, in this space. And importantly and, and excitedly, you know, when Martin and I were talking about this, the body of research, the body of knowledge continues to expand on almost a daily basis. There's a headline from mid-February uh, expanding on the, on the research around omega-3s and reduction of stroke. There's a researcher at Columbia University, Richard Deckelbaum, has done some fantastic work uh, uh, in this space. And if that's a subject that interests you, I recommend uh, I recommend you reach out to him and uh, and see what he uh, see what he's doing. Unfortunately, and as a general proposition, Martin alluded to this as well. We, uh, as a global population, and particularly we in the West, are omega three deficient. This is a heat map that was done in two thousand and sixteen. Uh, and the colors mean exactly what you think they would mean. If you see red, it means that the people in that geographic location are omega-3 deficient. And if you see green, that means they're taking adequate levels of omega-3s. And unfortunately for most of us in the developed world, we are omega-3 deficient. It's an ongoing problem that DSM is trying to, uh, trying to address through talks like this, um, through other activities. T today is actually March 3rd, 0303. It's Global Omega-3 Day, when the global omega-3 community uh, takes the opportunity to, uh, to promote the benefits of omega-3s for improving human health. So all of these activities we undertake to try to address what we view as a very significant problem. Interestingly, most people don't know where omega-3s come from. People know fish oil. And we've done lots of research on the topic. A subset of people kind of know what omega-3s are, but it's starting to get fuzzy there. And virtually nobody knows what EPA and DHA is, which is a problem in my view, and it's where I get on my soapbox from time to time because fundamentally we're talking about two different molecules. EPA, 20 carbon atoms, five double bonds. DHA, 22 carbon atoms, six double bonds. Each one of them separately has benefits and can accomplish different things. Together, the research shows us that if you change the ratio of EPA and DHA, these molecules together can do different things um, beyond even the molecules individually. So that's great. Um, most of that today comes from, uh, from fish oil, in particular the oil from sardines and anchovies. What do those guys look like? Oh, there's a picture. Um, on the right, see sardines, anchovies, uh, so you can get the, get the context of how big they are on the left. And this is actually kind of an important picture because it shows anchovies in the wild. Their mouths are open. What are they doing? They are, uh, they are filtering the water for zooplankton because that's how they accumulate EPA and DHA in their flesh. And importantly, most of the fish oil sold today, most of the fish oil that, uh, that is produced has EPA and DHA in a very specific ratio, three parts EPA, two parts DHA. So if you look at Small Flip It, if you look at Omega Ven, if you look at Abbott's Pro Shore, Nestle's Impact, et cetera, you'll see generally that uh, that EPA DHA ratio of, uh, of three to two, that becomes important uh, in a little bit. I say there are problems, I say more, uh, more concerns than problems because you can always address, uh, address all of them. Um, one of the problems when you're looking at a natural resource, fish, anchovies, sardines, um, you may immediately think of overfishing, and overfishing is a problem for all global fisheries. It's a picture of fishing intensity in 1950. Red is uh, high level of intensity, orange medium level, blue low level, and if there's no coloring, really no intensity whatsoever. Fast forward to 2009, you see a quantum difference. The level of fishing intensity has been... Uh, has magnified at an exponential level. And then what happens when, uh, when you see something like that? Well, the results are kind of predictable. 
presently today, as we're sitting here, one third of all global fisheries are overfished. What does that mean? That means we're taking more fish out of the ocean than the ocean can replenish. That's a problem. Two thirds are fished to a maximum sustainable level, which means that we're taking out exactly what we need to uh, in order for the species to, uh, to replenish themselves. Beyond that, however, um, most folks are aware of climate change. I think of and talk about something a little bit different, climactic change, um, and specifically ocean temperatures. Why do we care about ocean temperatures? Because these fish, anchovies, sardines, like cold water. Uh, they're kind of different than humans who like warm things. Anchovies, sardines, like cold water. And unfortunately, ocean temperatures are increasing. This on the left is a table from the NOAA showing ocean temperatures, average ocean temperatures over the last 40 years. You can see the dotted black line is the, uh, is the mean from 1982 to 2011. The yellow line is 2023 and the black line is 2024. So you can see ocean temperatures are increasing. This affects the physiology of anchovies and sardines and it affects their behavior and ultimately that manifests in how much fish oil we're able to, uh, to produce and sell into the market. On the right, again, particularly relevant for us, most anchovies and sardines come from the west coast of Peru. You see that area is bright red. It means ocean temperature increases are especially acute. Also, a lot of anchovies and sardines come from the west coast of Africa. Again, very dark red. It's an acute problem. We see this manifested in publications, something from the New York Times talking about fish in Iceland and how they're moving around to the detriment of, uh, of trade. More, uh, more close to home, if you're from, uh, from the East Coast, uh, the Chesapeake region relies on Menhaden for, for both omega-3s and, uh, and for general nutrition. Lots of folks in the East Coast very concerned about collapsing Menhaden populations. Was, what do I do at the end of all of that? How do I wrap all of that up with a very simple sort of statistic? Six times higher. What, what is six times higher than what? Well, in 2022, raw material for most fish oil um, cost about $2 a kilo, crude fish oil. Now, today in 2024, that same raw material costs $12 a kilo. A huge increase in cost. That affects the cost of manufacturing for every product that's out there. Fasipa, Lavaza, Omegavin, um, Small Flippid, ProSure, Impact, et cetera. For us at DSM, you know, we're obviously in the business of making money, but we're also in the business of improving human health, and we're concerned about that. We're concerned about the increasing cost of the raw material. We're concerned about uh, the availability of the raw material. So how do we address it? Anybody can point out a problem. Uh, it takes thought to figure out what the solution is. And I'll tell you what our solution is by reference to uh, a food chain. On the left, you see marine algae. This is actually where it all starts. Marine algae produce EPA and DHA. They use it uh, as a store of, of energy, single cell organism. Zooplankton eat the algae. In turn, our little anchovies, I showed you the picture earlier, they eat the zooplankton. Uh, we come along as human beings and, uh, and harvest all of those fish of the ocean. The flesh is actually used in agriculture and aquaculture as meal to feed uh, cattle, swine, etc. Also to feed farm fish. So if you uh, are a fan of farm salmon, you go to uh, you know Publix or wherever you get farm salmon. It's probably fed with fish meal that comes from anchovies. So we're feeding the anchovies uh, to the to the salmon, and then of course, ultimately byproduct of that process, crude fish oil is processed, refined, and ultimately makes its way into the, into the food chain. What DSM did to solve the problem is we basically cut out all of the middle steps. We go straight from marine algae to end consumer, and we do that by industrial fermentation. Now, sometimes that's referred to, and uh, uh, to use the language of the day, as uh, precision fermentation. We've been doing this for, uh, for 30 years, for a very long time. It all started, actually, with NASA. You say, well, what does NASA have to do with the mega-3s? Um, NASA, in the 1980s, was trying to figure out, how do I get astronauts from Earth to Mars, uh, and how do I feed them, and how do I allow them to, uh, to keep adequate supplies of oxygen, oxygen, excuse me, and they, their solution or potential solution to that was to use fermentation. 
produce algae on the spaceship. They can eat the algae. The algae also will allow for uh, production of air. Ultimately, that effort was abandoned. But the scientists who were involved in it said, hey, listen, we think there's something here. Let's do something about it. So they commercialized the technology, founded a company called Martech Biosciences, which over a period of time, you know, further developed its IP, you know, IPO in 1993. And then things really took off in the 2000s when DHA and another fatty acid called ARA um, were, uh, were introduced into infant formula here in the U.S. So now, as I said, for the mass, vast majority of infant formula products made now by DSM Furminish um, go into that infant formula. If you've had kids, you use a commercial formula. Some of that, um, some of that contains our products. Continuing into 2010s, and then DSM bought Martech, and uh, and we've continued the growth trajectory. So, why do I tell all of that? Uh, why do I tell you all of that? Because we've been in the space for a very long time. We're very good at uh, an industrial fermentation. That kind of brings us to actually today. So, as I said earlier, part of the part of the problem or part of the challenge is that most fish oil contains EPA and DHA in a ratio of three to two. Unfortunately. Until recently, most algal oils, including the ones that we make, had a lot of DHA uh, and no EPA. That is now um, different. We have developed an algal oil which has the exact same EPA to DHA ratio as, as fish oil. Why is that relevant? Because that helps in reformulation activities. If you are out there as a, as a company and you have a product that has fish oil in it, I want it to be as simple, as painless, as frictionless for you to reformulate as possible. And the easiest way to do that is to present an algal oil that has that same EPA to DHA ratio. And you don't have to redo your clinical trials and it becomes, um, it becomes it's never completely simple, but it becomes simpler. Importantly, for all concerned, we've done our own work to show that this algal oil has the same bioavailability, same health benefits as a corresponding fish oil. Uh, and interestingly, it's actually twice as potent as most fish oil. So this is interesting, at least we think it's interesting because it allows, it allows the company to say, okay, if I want to keep the level of EPA and DHA in my current formulation, I can cut the amount of oil in half. Or alternatively, if I want to increase the amount of EPA and DHA I'm delivering, I just keep the same level of oil. So we'll see how that uh, materializes. For medical food space, these algal oils that we've developed have superior organoleptic characteristics when compared to fish oil. Again, for medical food and for compliance purposes, that's really important. It's fully controlled manufacturing. In the top right-hand picture, these are the fermenters that we have at our site in King Street in South Carolina. Again, this is very large-scale industrial fermentation conducted at near-pharmaceutical GMP standards because we're putting this oil into infant formula, so incredibly important. Uh, and in the lower right, in case you had a misconception, you thought, oh, algal oil, that's... Uh, that's green, the green layer on top of ponds. That's, uh, that's not the case. If you can see the picture when you are fermenting algal oil, it actually has a bit of an orangish hue that comes from the carotenoids that the, uh, that the algae are producing. No green involved anywhere. And then finally, reduction of impact on the environment versus fish oil. Now, lots of folks out there are rightly skeptical about claims of environmentally friendly and sustainable, et cetera. So we and others uh, have looked at this from a quantitative as opposed to a qualitative standpoint. We've conducted what's called an LCA, life cycle assessment, which is basically a process to measure all the inputs associated with the production of something. Uh, and, you, and then you, you change that um, to the number of kilograms of carbon dioxide produced by that input or by that process. You add all of that up, you get a number. What we did a little bit differently than most folks is we've also included uh, an environmental aspect to it because you can have a process that's wonderfully efficient from a CO2 emission standpoint, uh, but if at the end of the day you're harming the environment or the impact on the environment is bad, you've got to record that somehow. So these are the results. We looked at one of our own fish oil products. This is a tuna oil product that goes into uh, that goes into infant formula. Overall, eco points per kg of EPA and DHA of 11, 
we compared that again to one of our own algal oils, which has an overall level of two. So that's how we can say to our customers and to consumers, yes, I know you are skeptical about these claims. We've looked at it quantitatively and we can demonstrate to you why this algal oil is better for the environment than this fish oil. How are we doing for timing, Julia? Five minutes, okay. I'm gonna skip this and go to, um, get a bit of a mentee poll. So if you, have, uh, if you have a phone and you're familiar with mentee meter, Please scan the QR code, and we've got a couple of questions. Hopefully, this will uh, hopefully this will work. Got it, Martin. All right. All right. So here is question number one. What? Should be what? Uh, what are the key reasons you would consider algal over fish oil omega threes? So it should produce uh, result in a word cloud. Give folks a few minutes to think about that. Excellent, love the responses. Cost, cost is an important one, no question. Interesting plant-based, you know, that's a, that's a discussion that we have internally. Should we be talking about algal omega-3s as being plant-based or does it, uh, does it actually matter if we're delivering these molecules in what we think is the most efficient way? Does the fact that it's not from an animal actually matter? Does it resonate both within the consumer community and the healthcare practitioner community? You know, we've talked to a couple of pharmaceuticals who have actually said, listen, I don't really care. I don't care about the sustainability, I don't care about any of it. I want to I want you to give us these molecules in the most efficient way at the best cost uh, with the lowest profile of uh, of contaminants and other things and I'm not going to differentiate in my product uh, between fish oil and and algal oil. So that's but that's different than uh, than other potential customers. So I think it really depends on the application, depends on what folks are trying to accomplish. Okay. Second question. Thank you for that, by the way. Would you now consider algal oil as a replacement for fish oil in your practice, if available? Knowing that there are a number of products out there which are fish oil based, if you think about that, would you consider algal oil as a replacement for those fish oil based products? I'm glad to. I'm glad to see that nobody says, at least not yet, would not consider that. Uh, um, that, that means we've kind of. Uh, I think we've painted a picture which I think resonates with uh, with folks. So thank you. That's that's all I have. I want to thank everybody for your attention, your participation. Uh, hopefully, between Martin and myself, you've learned something new, and I hope at the end of the day that it's something that you can take forward into uh, into your own activities practices both as consumers and healthcare practitioners. Thank you all. And we have a few minutes for questions. If anybody has a question, we're happy to, uh, happy to take them. Yes, I'm, I'm just wondering whether you, whether you have um, any uh, objective evidence by means of, say, red cell EPA levels um, on the difference between algal oil and fish oil. Um, can you demonstrate better red cell EPA levels with algal? In, in the way that you saw that heat map at a grand scale, no, but we have done, we have done studies uh, to demonstrate an equal bioavailability between those two forms. And I think intuitively it, uh, 
it makes sense. They're both natural triglyceride oils. The body takes them in, breaks apart the bond between glycerol and the fatty acids to free those fatty acids for use in the body. So intuitively, it makes sense, and we've demonstrated that is also the case. Hi. Um, I just have a question. I don't know if the doctor used ERAS protocol. ERAS protocol? The protocol? ERAS? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just wondering, like, why don't we add, like, this supplementation for the patient? Um, What do you think? Have you done that? I don't know. Yeah, so in our, in our current protocol, we uh, do the immune nutrition. You know, we do use um, protein shakes. Um, so I have a grant that uh, allowed me to buy a lot of protein shakes. So as opposed to the patient to go buy $80 worth of immune nutrition shakes online, we just give it to them. And so that ensures that at least they have it in their hand walking out of my clinic. It usually means they take it. I usually get some feedback saying uh, the immune nutrition shakes didn't taste that great, but the 50 gram glucose load was awesome. And uh, at least then I know they tried it. Uh, and so we do load our patients with omega-3 fatty acids. And then on top of it, you know, there's, there's not really a body of literature that supports ERAS Uh, immunonutrition in patients on parental support, but I do take uh, the lipid emulsions we use as uh, typically SMOF, and so I will increase the days that they get SMOF. And you know, I wish I could get to a paradigm where I could give it every single day, uh, you know, two weeks before, but I live in a culture at our hospital where it, it's let's just say it's hard to do that, but we do try and do some derivation of immune nutrition in our PN patients, and we even increase the uh, grams of arginine that they're getting. So we, we do have a protocol. Thank you.